All right, we are recording. Welcome everyone to the CTSC webinar for August 22nd, 2016. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Today's topic is Science DMZ as a Security Architecture, and it's going to be presented by Energy Sciences Network's Michael Sinatra. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity in the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect window. So. And we will accept questions after the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand the microphone off to Michael. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me OK? It's great. Thank you. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that there's a little bit of delay when I start talking to when you actually hear it. So I'll, I'll try to kind of manage that as much as I can. Um, thank you guys for having me here. I see a lot of people on the participants list who I know, which makes me a little nervous, of course. Um, and I also understand that a lot of people are interested in this particular topic, which also makes me a little bit nervous because um, I don't think I'm really going to tell you a whole lot that you don't already know. Uh, I think that, that the main goal of this talk is going to be to have you look at something or a set of concepts, a set of things that you already understand and you already know pretty well, maybe look at them a little bit differently than you currently do. And if that's kind of what happens, then uh, I would be really kind of very happy that, that I would think that this was kind of a, a little bit of a success in that respect. There's no magic bullet here. There's no obvious uh, recipe that I can give you that's going to suddenly make a science DMZ secure. What I'm instead going to try to do is, is try to make you understand a little bit about, or try to help me understand too, a little bit about how the Science DMZ itself can improve the overall security posture of your campus. In that respect, I'm kind of changing the, um, the game a little bit. To say a little bit about me, I've just been doing security for about 20 years or so. So it's, it's been, I've seen a lot of different things come and go and a lot of different fads come and go. And this is actually kind of a boring slide about me, so I'll just skip it. But I think what I'm, I'm thinking about here in terms of how the Science DMZ helps your campus is really to look at the Science DMZ not as something that needs to be controlled. It's not a, it is a, a, a campus resource that needs to have security controls applied to it but it's also itself a security control. And if that sounds kind of funny, um, think about this. Think about Palo Alto Networks. A week ago today, what did they do? They issued a security vulnerability for their operating system. Now, Palo Alto Networks makes sort of the darling firewall of higher ed, the, the next generation security appliance. And it is a very commonly used security control, but it also exposes your institution to a certain amount of risk. It has its own set of vulnerabilities, and it is itself something that needs to be controlled. So in the same respect that something like a next-gen firewall or a very sophisticated piece of what we consider security equipment also needs to be secured in its own way, the Science DMZ is not something that just needs to be secured. It's something that needs to be used as a tool to improve the overall security of your campus. A couple of logistical things I want to point out. I'm going to go a little bit more into more depth in the content during this presentation than I did last week. Those of you who may have seen the last week's presentation, because um, I actually have more time. But I'm also not going to take up all of the time with me talking. Uh, and the main reason for that, other than um, I actually do finally at some point get tired of hearing myself talk, but I also brought a, a stowaway. I don't think I applied the right security controls when I was in Washington, D.C., and like I often do, I brought home a, a kind of nasty little cold here. 
And so I don't think my voice is going to last all the way through. And I do apologize if you hear coughing or some sort of siphling of a sneeze. Um, but that's just, uh, that's just the way it's going to be, unfortunately. So please bear with me. Um, one of the things that I've tried to um, sort of look at throughout my I don't know, career, if you will, in looking at security is try to really focus as much as I can on risk. What kinds of risks are, are important to the organization and what kinds of, um, you know, what kinds of, of controls can we apply, but how do we let risk drive the, the process? Also, how do we empower people at different levels of the organization to take charge of their own security? I call this building a security culture and I've kind of overused the term but it is definitely um, something that I'm more interested in is how do we build sort of an interactive approach to security that focuses on maximizing the knowledge base in campus and maximizing the risk-based approach. So I'm really interested in the science DMZ in, in as much as it has this ability to, to bring the research community into the fold and get the research community talking to the central IT organization but also it allows the research community to look at their own security posture and concerns they may have over the risks of, for example, data or conclusions or findings uh, of their studies getting into the wrong hands at the wrong time. You know, are there actual risks that, that arise in the research uh, side of the house and really get them thinking about that too. So the Science DMZ, I think, really helps in getting that conversation going. And those of you with the sort of CCNIE and, and derivative grants know that that's one of the big goals of that is to have the research community engaged just as much as the networking community is engaged. One of the things that the Science DMZ has done over the years that I've noticed that's kind of frustrated me just a little bit is it has generated some myths, and, and most of those myths are really around the notion of security controls. The idea that the Science DMZ is really about avoiding security controls. If you've ever watched uh, Nick Baraglio give a talk on this subject, he has a lot of security controls that get applied to Science DMZs. There's actually a lot of things you can do with the Science DMZ. And a lot of the reason that you can do so many interesting, sophisticated things with the Science DMZ is because we're actually segmenting one particular function and moving it into a separate part of the network, which allows us to apply separate sets of security controls to the Science DMZ that really help to minimize the particular types of risk that the Science DMZ generates. So really, as I'm going to talk about later in, in this discussion, it's really about segmentation and how segmentation leads us to a specific set of security controls that work best for the Science DMZ. Far from trying to avoid controls, we're actually trying to apply more controls both to the Science DMZ and also to the other parts of the campus network that need more specific, specialized security controls in order to improve the security for other parts of campus, not just the Science DMZ. If you look at the Science DMZ as simply, we're trying to route around firewalls, um, then you're missing part of, in my view, you're missing part of the, what, the, what the Science DMZ is really supposed to be about. In many respects, it's about reducing complexity. It is about reducing things like middle boxes that are both complex and help impede the overall performance of the science DMZ. But it's also about reducing the degrees of freedom and the number of things that you have to troubleshoot. And that ends up being really important because in the field of large scale data transfer, you're not just transferring, uh, you're not just, you know, you're not just trying to secure something. You're not just trying to, to maintain a function. You're not just trying to keep the network up you're actually extremely concerned with the performance of the network. So when it comes to troubleshooting, it's not just a case of our science DMZ is down, but if our science DMZ isn't performing the way it needs to perform, that's something you have to troubleshoot also. So you wanna to try to reduce the kinds of things that you have to troubleshoot. That's reducing operational risk and functional risk and also security risk. 
So of course, one of the problems with doing all of this is that if you do have a large, complicated, stateful firewall or deep packet inspection device that's in line, it is a big, complicated thing that you're going to need to troubleshoot. We know that from the work that Eli Dart and others have done that most firewalls, even if they have 20 gig interfaces, and even if they can, even if they're rated for a throughput of say 20 gigs per second, they don't actually, they aren't actually able to do a large scale data flow that is at 20 gigabits per second. Because what they're actually doing is they're splitting flows out into separate channels and then they're doing the inspection on those separate channels. And those separate channels may not have a capacity that is the maximum 20 gigabits per second capacity, even though the firewall is rated to be able to handle 20 gigabits per second. So performance is definitely an issue, but it's not the only issue. Troubleshooting is also an important issue. And as we know, the firewall always gets blamed whenever there's a problem. It's not just a question of, you know, is the firewall actually causing the problem? Even if the firewall is not causing the problem, you still have to troubleshoot it. You still have to make sure that it's not the thing that's causing the problem. So firewalls are certainly a big part of what we're concerned with in the Science DMZ, but they're not the only part. And routing around the firewall is not a sufficient condition for building a good science DMZ. So what I really want to do instead is look at the science DMZ differently. I want to look at the science DMZ as a specific security architecture that actually is used as a tool in the larger security arsenal that you have. And it allows you to do a better job of securing your campus overall. And to do that, we really need to look at risk and how we assess risk and how we, how we do a risk-based security program. So in the paper that I've written about this, which um, is going to be released as part of the proceedings of the NSF um, Cyber Infrastructure Security Conference I was at last week, and I can certainly share that paper with anyone who wants it, I go over a little bit looking at risk-based security approaches versus control-based security approaches. And this is kind of hard to do, this kind of literature review, because nobody really wants to admit that they like control-based security. Everyone thinks risk-based security is obviously the way to go. And if you aren't doing risk-based security, then you're doing something wrong. Um, but you know, the, the purpose of risk-based security is to let a careful risk assessment drive the security controls that you employ rather than picking from a checklist of security controls. So if that's the case, then everyone should be doing risk-based risk security. And in fact, most people advocate risk-based security. Oh, I have a new Firefox update, great. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, most people advocate risk-based security, and it's actually very hard to find anyone who advocates control-based security. And in fact, most of the discussions of control-based security are pretty much dismissive. Uh, the first sort of sub-bullet point I have there where it says you apply controls because the standard says so, that comes from the CEO in his blog of a company called FR Security, which is a security consultancy, and he's talking there about the NIST, NIST risk framework. Um, you can probably Google that statement to find the source. Right after that sentence, he says that control-based securities are destined to fail because they're both ineffective and expensive. So really, that's a pretty strong damnation of control-based security, and it's really hard to find anyone who advocates for it. But it turns out we do a lot of control-based security, and the reason we do that is that risk-based security is actually pretty hard. It's labor-intensive, a lot of the reason we're applying security controls is to comply with a set of policies or perhaps regulatory frameworks. And those policies and regulatory frameworks often specify controls. In some cases, all they do is specify controls. In other cases, like for example, the PCI, PCI DSS controls uh, or PCI DSS um, framework, what it does is it gives you a risk and then gives you a suggested control. You're allowed to apply compensating controls, which is great, but the problem is that compensating controls, you know, it requires you to build the control, create the control, and then have someone review it and make sure 
that it actually does meet the risk that it's trying to meet. So compensating controls are actually much more labor intensive than simply checking off the standard control that's already suggested to you by the framework you're using. So that's why we often don't do risk-based security. We often end up doing control-based security because we have a regulatory framework that tells us to do it and we just want to get it done. Um, a lot of people refer to this as compliance-based security, but what I would actually say is that control-based security is a way to do compliance. It's probably the easiest way to do sort of the checkbox compliance that we often talk about and, and in fact sometimes we have a, a sort of derogatory attitude toward. But I think there's considerable benefit to doing risk-based security. In the long run, it's actually going to be less expensive because you're going to be doing a better job of mitigating your risk and you're going to do it without unnecessary expense in the long term. It's still really hard to do risk-based security. Of course, it's also not that easy to do control-based security because you don't actually know if the controls you're using are meeting the risks that you actually face. One of the problems with this is that, uh, and I actually got this wrong, it's not the non-falsifiability of security assessments, it's actually the unfalsifiability of security assessments. So if you Google for unfalsifiability of security assessments, you're gonna find a Microsoft research paper. It's written in the form of formal logic and it does a lot of proofs, but what it really tries to say is that you cannot ever establish the sufficient conditions for security and nor can you ever establish the necessary conditions. I'm sorry, you cannot, it's the other way around. You cannot establish the necessary conditions for security, nor can you establish the sufficient conditions for insecurity because those are actually non-falsifiable statements. So it takes a very sort of scientific or social scientific or philosophical approach to doing security. But maybe another way of looking at it is that it's really impossible to ever know whether you've secured anything. And put in sort of more lay terms, it's actually really difficult to know if the security controls you put in place have actually had effect, they've actually prevented bad guys from getting into your network, or do the bad guys simply not care? So another way of thinking about it is, um, you know, this classic dog that didn't bark. You can look at the, say, the OPM breach, and you can say, well, if, if OPM had been using multi-factor authentication and forcing its contractors to do multi-factor authentication, the OPM breach wouldn't have happened. And you can make a pretty reasonable counterfactual argument that goes along those lines. But can you say that some other organization that's been using multi-factor authentication for the last eight or nine years and hasn't had a breach would have had a breach? if it had not used multi-factor authentication, you really can't because you don't know if the bad guys just didn't care about that organization. It simply wasn't on their radar. The organization was too obscure and security through obscurity actually worked. You just really don't know what kinds of controls have had an effect over time and haven't had an effect over time. And this sort of leads to people, particularly in the, in the firewall business of basically taking their firewall logging everything that's on their firewall, every log that it has, including its memory is full and things like that, into Splunk and then counting up all the firewall logs and say, look, boss, this is how many attacks we presented, we prevented last week. We know that doesn't really make any sense, but it's, it's, it's something that's actually measurable. It's sort of one of those searchlight problems where you actually have a measurable metric, but it, it actually doesn't mean anything. So it leads us to all these sorts of weird difficult things, and it, it does mean that risk assessment itself can be rather difficult. However, I believe we can do it. And we can do it especially if we do things like take parts of the network that have common functions and separate them out so that the risk assessment itself is easier. We know that in the security world, we have sort of the classic Rumsfeld's razor. You know, we, we have lots of unknown unknowns. But if you have a big, complicated network, as most universities do, and even national labs do, national labs have the advantage of not having students in their residence halls, although we do have lots of students at national labs who come in and bring their laptops and things like that onto um, our lab campuses. So we actually have a very wide set of risks across the network in the organization. And you have to say that, that 
certainly students in their residence halls present a very different set of risk than uh, certainly the business side, and especially when you consider that students are actually adults in their own homes and they're doing things that adults in their own homes do and they should be allowed to do those things. How do you apply the same set of con security controls that you would actually apply to, say, student data, which is something that's very different and has a very different set of risks? So the set of risks that you have across your campus are going to vary so significantly that it's very difficult to apply one set of controls on your campus border. I keep wanting to hit my arrow key here when I want to advance the slide instead of pushing the little arrow button. So that's why I'm pausing for a second. So <clears throat> one of the things we like to do is, is basically segment the network. And we already do this in a lot of places because of regulatory frameworks like HIPAA and PCI. So why not do this with science as well? And again, keep in mind that I'm, I'm approaching this from a security viewpoint. The set of risks that science traffic and science data bring up to the organization are very different than the set of risks that credit card data, student data, health data, those sorts of things bring up for an organization. So why not move the science DMZ into its own place, just like we already do with the health data networks and with business networks and with credit card processing networks. Now, it may be the case, by the way, that there is some science data that also has HIPAA implications or it has sensitive data implications where we don't want that data to be exposed. Either we don't want it to be exposed prematurely or we don't want it to be exposed at all to the wrong people. And I do have ways of controlling that within the Science DMZ. But it's still a very different sort of thing. The Science DMZ is really about sharing data with the right people. It's not about trying to restrict data as much as we can. And given that, it makes sense to segment the Science DMZ. So the whole point, or at least a significant point of the Science DMZ, is using network segmentation as a strategy. But as I'm going to point out, network segmentation just isn't a strategy that benefits science. It's going to benefit your whole network because it's going to allow you to apply tighter controls to other parts of your network. So I have two scenarios about how this is going to be the case. And the first one has to do with scientific instruments. And I've had a lot of experience with scientific instruments over the last 20 years. And I think maybe some of you have too. Scientific instruments have... Um, usually need to be controlled or driven by a computer. That computer usually runs a commodity operating system, but it has customized software that drives the instrument and collects data off of the instrument. Unfortunately, that customized software often is very difficult to maintain, and it's actually very hard to do things like maintaining the actual system that is running the customized software that's driving the instrument. You may have seen things like nuclear magnetic resonance systems that have old sun workstations driving them. Um, many types of scientific instruments in the biological sciences may have devices that are running Windows XP and it can't be upgraded. Even if it is running a modern supported operating system, sometimes you simply can't patch that operating system. You can't apply the latest service patch or the latest patch set, because that somehow breaks the uh, software that's running that scientific instrument. At the same time, you may have requirements for uh, data sharing from your scientific instrument. So if you imagine a little stylized example here, we have a lab. That lab has a scientific instrument. That, that looks sort of like a mass spec machine to me, but that's just me. And that's connected on a private network to the machine that's actually driving it, that little computer that is, uh, that's sort of sitting down there. And that computer you can see is directly connected to the campus network. The campus network is connected to the big bad internet. Now at the time we, we hooked a lot of these things up back in the old days, 20 years ago, and I was supporting some of these instruments. The big bad internet was starting to get big and bad, but it wasn't quite so bad. So 
you know, it was still kind of reasonable to do something like this. But pretty quickly, you, you realize this isn't such a great idea. We shouldn't be connecting this machine directly to the network, even though we do have to share the data, even though we have to share the instrument in some cases with collaborators. So how do we deal with that? Well, if we just need to share the data, one of the things we can often do is, and this was often what you, you would see in the old days, you might see uh, your grad students in the lab, they might just throw up a little, you know, Unix box here, Linux box, um, that is, well, we hope it's patched, maybe they remember to patch it, but basically it acts as a bastion host and it stores and forwards the data that's necessary to be shared. So people can log into the bastion host, they can collect data off of the machine that is driving the instrument, and then they can save the data, you know, transmit it back to their home campus or wherever they are where they're doing the collaboration. Again, though, this doesn't scale because if you have lots of labs and lots of instruments, you're going to have um, many of these little boxes lying around and they don't, um, you know, again, you're, you're relying on machines that may or may not be professionally managed or may or may not be managed at all. Another option that sometimes happened, and this used to happen a lot when I was at UC Berkeley, is somebody sticks a little CPE router in there. And um, it's just like a Linksys router that you might connect to a DSL or cable line. And they use that to NAT the instrument behind the lab. Now, if they still need to share the data, you're going to have to do something where you either poke a hole in that little NAT router or you have to give, you have to stick another bastion host somewhere inside that people log into. It, it, it gets kind of complicated. And what also complicates it is you've got students coming in and they're going to plug their laptops into that little uh, CPE router, or they're going to turn on the little wireless antenna that the CPE router is and there has, and they're going to log in to other places via that CPE router. Their computers may have security vulnerabilities on them. Your security group is going to see those security vulnerabilities because they're going to see the traffic going in and out, or they may actually see evidence of a compromise because they're trying to access some malware site. And your security group is going to block the whole thing. Uh, the, that is the connection that, that goes to between the campus network and that little CPE router, and then the lab's out of business. So that's not actually a really scalable or useful way to handle the situation either. So one way you could do this is to build a DTN in your campus data center. And I'm just calling it a DTN. I'm not calling it quite a science DMZ just yet. And then you can see what I've done is I've actually built a really large firewall. There's a big, big firewall right there that's firewalling off the lab. Um, what it's actually doing is it's basically restricting what the lab control machine can do. It can only talk to the DTN. So what it's going to do is it's going to save its data to the DTN and then the DTN makes that available for export there. The DTN you can see has a very large storage array and it also is because it's in your data center it can be located close to your border router as well so it can be at the main network node where your border router is. So it actually starts to become a science DMZ here because you're connecting it into a very large high capacity device you're professionally managing it and doing all that stuff. And that allows us to provide a very large firewall. What I mean by very large is it's basically default denied. It's blocking everything except the ability of that little computer to go to the instrument. So what you can see now is we've actually increased the security of the lab by adding a data transfer node that we've been professionally managing here in the campus data center. Now, there's another thing we can do, which is now we're turning this into more of a science DMZ. There's actually an optical tap, and that little red box is a bro machine that is doing intrusion detection. And then you have the DTN there inside your either your campus data center or a, a well-designed network hub site. And they're, they're, if you actually are really, really paranoid and you don't want this instrument to even be on the network at all, then what you do is you can actually have the instrument computer, the control computer, you can have that computer save all of its data to a storage array. And you can actually migrate the disks from the storage array into the DTN. Now, that does sound a lot like sneaker net. You might be saying, well, isn't this the whole point of the DTN not to have to move disks around? 
Well, yes, that is true. But at least in this case, what you're doing is you are moving disks, but you're doing it in a way that is much easier than, say, shipping disks across the country. You can now make the data available to a variety of collaborators over the network. And you can have that lab and that scientific instrument completely isolated from the rest of the world or even the rest of campus. Now, that may still be a little bit too much, and you may not want to transport disks across your campus, let alone you know, to some other place. So what you can also do here is have an out-of-band connection. This connection could actually be a direct fiber channel connection, or it could be something like iSCSI if you have a separate iSCSI network. And you can have the lab machine mount a LUN on the DTN's storage array. If you imagine that storage array is now not uh, directly attached storage, but it's some sort of SAN, and it might be able to export LUNs over, I, uh, over iSCSI or over Fiber Channel. Now you can have a bunch of lab computers accessing the storage array directly on different LUNs, saving the data to the LUN, unmounting the LUN, and then you have the DTN mount the LUN and make the data available for export. Again, this is in the case where you have particularly strong security requirements for the instrument, but you can see how the security posture is still dramatically improved over the previous situation because, again, the DTN or the, uh, the instrument computer is never actually touching the main campus IP network, nor is it uh, have any way of accessing the outside world, or does anyone in the outside world have any way of accessing it? Um, let's suppose the data has some restricted requirements or some sensitivity requirements. What do you do in that situation? Well, one way you could do it is you want to keep the data encrypted as much as possible. So what you can do in this situation is you can mount the LUN, save the data, have another computer that maybe has crypto accelerator or TPM in it, have that mount the LUN and have it encrypt the data at rest and then unmount it. That encrypting machine doesn't have access to the outside network. It has a bunch of private keys on it or it's doing some sort of encryption that is um, asymmetric key encryption and it has the private keys for the asymmetric key encryption on it. Uh, but it's not actually touching the outside network. So the computer that's actually doing the encryption that's very sensitive doesn't ever touch the rest of the world. And then you have, after the encryption is completed as an atomic operation, you have the, the DTN mounts the file system and the uh, encryption, the data is already encrypted at rest at that point. So the collaborators can then download the data, use their private keys to decrypt the data and use it as they see fit. Now, you could also think of this as, uh, you could also think of this as sort of a global file system, like a GPFS or Lustre. Um, but in that case, if you're doing that, then you're going to be saving the data from the, um, the little uh, instrument computer, and it's going to be unencrypted for a while. So the DTN may have access to unencrypted data for a certain amount of time. And if that's the case, what you may want to do is, is have a system that is capable of encrypting the data inline before it gets saved. And I'm kind of assuming that the little instrument computer isn't powerful enough or doesn't have the proper encryption software or hardware to do that. So what you can actually do is build an inline encryption system that, again, doesn't have access to the larger network and can only write to the, the, the global file system, the Lustre GPFS. But by the time it gets put on that file system, that information is fully encrypted. So by the time the DTN has access to it, the data is already encrypted in this particular case. Now, if you have a regulatory framework like HIPAA or something like that, this may not be good enough, or it may be a sufficiently complicated compensating control that it takes a long time to get anyone to actually uh, sign off on it. So I understand that this may not be the easiest thing to do, but if you have data that you want to keep secure and confidential, this may be a good way to do it. Now, in this particular case, I've sort of designed an encryption system that has a whole bunch of keys on it. It doesn't actually have to have any private keys on it because if it's just doing encryption, it can do encryption with the public keys of all the people who need to access the data. 
Uh, but you may want to have the encryption system, and I don't really, I just sort of do this for completeness. I don't really advocate this particular design, but you may want to include the encryption system in the lab so that you don't have a lot of unencrypted data traversing even your private iSCSI network or your private fiber channel network. The only problem with that is it doesn't really scale because now you have to put little encrypting devices in every lab where you're going to use this kind of data. So um, it may work in certain circumstances where like maybe you have a large lab of gene sequencers or something like that. It may make sense to encrypt that data before you send it up to the file system but um, and, and not even have it get on the network very far before it's encrypted. But um, for most applications, you probably don't even need the encryption at all. I'm just sort of putting it in there in case uh, you do have those kinds of restricted data requirements. But most applications where you do need the encryption, you can have a central device that sort of sits in line and handles the encryption and then um, writes that information out to the file system. In my second scenario, I just gloss over this briefly because I want to end now, then very soon actually and have some time for questions. But I just want you to think a little bit about how you do HPC. A lot of HPC clusters have bastion hosts and data doors that are sort of built in to the HPC cluster. They are separate from the compute nodes, of course, but they, you may have a bunch of different HPC clusters across your campus that have their own sets of data doors. And the data doors may actually, you know, they're sort of like small DTNs. They may actually run some of the more classic DTN software like Grid FTP and Globus and, and things like that. You may also have bastion hosts, and those bastion hosts may run specialized software as well. And of course, the, the HPC compute nodes will be running specialized software to handle scheduling and those sorts of things. This all makes patching rather complicated. So one of the things you could do in this particular situation is to separate out the data transfer function from the compute function, essentially outsource all of the data door function on your HPCs to your science DMZ. Use a mechanism similar to what I've already talked about here to upload data to the DTN from the HPC system. Let the DTN with its specialized tuning and specialized software handle all of the large scale long distance data transfer. And then you can completely separate the management of those two systems. The DTN can be managed as a DTN with all of its custom tuning and its custom software. It can be patched carefully. And the HPC systems can also be patched carefully and managed with all of their custom software and all of their things. So in this particular case, you can take the set of individual customizations that the DTN provides and the HPC provide, separate them out and manage them separately. And again, that's going to minimize your operational risk and it's going to minimize your security risk as well. And I don't go too much into too much depth because I want to get to my conclusions. It's just one of those things that you, you can think about is how can I make the data transfer portion of the high performance compute nodes I have on my campus work better work more reliably, more reliably and actually improve the security of the HPC clusters as well as the security of the data transfer function. And this is a way in which the Science DMZ can again improve the overall security of your campus because you're actually improving not only the security of the science data itself, but you're also improving the security of things like scientific instruments and HPC clusters. You can apply more strict controls to them once you abstract out that data transfer function and data collaboration function. So one of the things I, one of the analogies I like to use, and I didn't actually bring this up at the, um, at the last talk, last time I gave this talk, but uh, I flew back uh, here to California on Thursday and um, I had a, a Terrific flights, by the way, both directions. I want to thank United Airlines for that. But I also want to say that, um, you know, I got kind of lucky. I, I flew in and we had thunderstorms coming in. The pilots had to steer around them. Uh, they obviously did a very good job because I was reading a book and I didn't feel any bumps. So we obviously did really well, as much as the pilots were complaining about having to steer around the thunderstorms. I would have been a lot more nervous, though, if um, throughout my journey, United Airlines had been advertising themselves as the airline that only cares about security. If United, all they cared about was making sure there weren't any terrorists on the plane, 
Um, that doesn't really solve all of the concerns that I have when I'm flying. I don't want things to fall off the plane that are actually crucial to the flying of the plane while it's flying. That's not a security issue. That's an operational issue. That's a reliability issue. I don't want pilots who don't understand how weather impacts the plane. I don't want pilots who can't route around thunderstorms, especially when I'm trying to read a good book. So from my perspective, security is one major component of, say, aviation, the airline industry. Commercial aviation, security is very important. But reliability, training, all those other things, the functional aspects of flying are also very important. And having an airline that's able to do those extremely well is critical to whether or not I want to fly somewhere. So I think that if you look at this from an information technology perspective, we're not just interested in security risk. We're also interested in operational risk and functional risk. And I mentioned early on in this slide deck the, uh, the point that Joe Sansave made many years ago about having a network usability officer, that somebody needs to sort of be a kind of a countervailing force to the security officer and say, security can't be the only thing we do. We have to be able to do things with this network. And increasingly, the internet in general is taking on very critical functions when it comes to things like energy, life safety, um, health, things like that. So we have to be concerned not just with the security risk, but also with the operational risk that different types of network architectures bring to us. And what the Science DMZ is really trying to do is minimize all of those through a strategy of network segmentation. By segmenting the network in a way that allows you to reduce complexity, reduce the set of things you have to look at, that really that set of unknown unknowns, as well as the set of known unknowns that you need to look at in terms of assessing security risks, the Science DMZ actually allows you to do a better job of looking at risk, a better job of estimating risk. You're not always going to be able to do a perfect assessment, but at least estimating risk, but also maximize the performance and operational functionality of the network. One of the other things that Science DMZ does is it also improves resiliency. Now, in security, resiliency is sort of the new buzzword. What resiliency basically means is that how quickly can I recover from an attack? You know, think about a Sony kind of attack where the whole company was basically off the internet for months. How do I recover from something like that and how do I do it quickly? How do I do it on the order of hours or minutes and not days or months? And that's one of the things that security, the security field is increasingly becoming concerned with because we're also starting to realize that it's actually pretty hard to defend against all attacks. So at some point, what happens if my science DMZ is compromised? How quickly can I recover? How quickly can I rebuild the uh, DTN? How quickly can I you know, mitigate the attack? What if the attack's a DDoS or some sort of DOS attack? What if somebody's taken over my science DMZ and is using it to DOS someone else? How quickly can I mitigate that? In the case of a self-contained science DMZ, it becomes very easy to do that because you can actually unplug it if you need to. I mean, you've got a very small network that has a, a limited number of connections yeah. to the campus border router, and it's pretty easy to shut those down if you need to. Worst case scenario, you unplug the thing. A lot of campuses are building what are called distributed science DMZs, or they're building things like um, sort of an MPLS-based overlay network that allows them to route science traffic around the firewall. Now, again, if you just think of a science DMZ as something that gets you around a firewall, then that actually makes sense. That quote unquote solves the problem. But it doesn't give you the full benefit of a science DMZ in the sense that you're not actually able to do the kinds of things that I said in terms of isolating parts of the network, making other parts of the network more secure, applying more strict security controls to different parts of the network. And it also impacts that resiliency aspect. How quickly can I mitigate an attack? How quickly can I recover from a compromise? How quickly can I stop a DDoS attack that's being originated on my campus from my science DMZ? If you have a big MPLS overlay that goes to lots of parts of your campus, how do you monitor and control that? You can still do it, but it becomes a lot more complicated. 
and it can be a lot more time consuming. So what I'm saying is not that we shouldn't be doing these kinds of overlays or these other sorts of things, but if we call those things science DMZs and assume that we've solved the problems that the science DMZ is trying to solve, then we actually may be missing some of the point. It's also adding complexity, and that brings up another point. I really like SDN technologies. I don't like the, the term SDN because the term SDN doesn't really mean anything. It's a marketing term or a buzzword now, but I like things like OpenFlow. Now, if you think of OpenFlow, OpenFlow has a lot of promise because it gives you a way of, again, routing elephant flows dynamically around a packet inspection device, like a deep packet inspection firewall or something like that. I get asked the question a lot, you know, what about SDN? And I say, well, SDN doesn't mean anything, but if you want to say, you know, would OpenFlow help solve the Science DMZ security problem? Because it could let you put a firewall in place, so you have that little checkbox, and then it could let you put this OpenFlow layer up above the firewall, which you could then use to route around the firewall for things like elephant flows, you know, large-scale data transfers, things like that. The problem with this is that the Science DMZ is also trying to reduce complexity and the number of things that you have to troubleshoot when you are dealing with large-scale science data flows. Now, if that's the case, you've just added two big layers of complexity to your science DMZ. You put the firewall back in place, which were, you know, again, one of the things that we have to troubleshoot. But you also put in this open flow layer into your science DMZ. And that's something else that you have to troubleshoot. And that can be actually very difficult. So adding open flow may not actually solve the problems of the science DMZ. It may not provide the best of both worlds that some people think it will be. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it or we shouldn't pay attention to it or we shouldn't continue to do research for how we can do kind of route around architectures with open flow technology. But what I am saying is, I don't know if it's gonna solve the problem that we really think it's gonna solve. And sometimes if a technology doesn't solve the problem you want it to solve, you think it's just bad. So, you know, for example, you push it up that hype slope and then it comes crashing down because it doesn't do all the things you want it to do. So I think in the end, we may be doing open flow a disservice if we try to make it seem like it's gonna solve this, it's gonna be this magic bullet that's gonna fix our science DMZ. It's gonna let us do our data really, really fast and also make it be totally secure. It may not do either because it provides that level of complexity and also increases the attack surface significantly. Because now you have an open flow controller to worry about, you have an open flow switch to worry about, you have the interconnection between the two of them, and you have your firewall to worry about, which firewalls sometimes have vulnerabilities too. So you've actually increased your attack surface in this particular situation. And that's one of the reasons I may not be as sanguine as other people are when it comes to the, the, the glory of open flow once we, um, you know, once we apply it to our science DMZ. So with that possibly provocative thing, I will break for the next 10 minutes or so, and I can actually stay a little late uh, for questions if uh, folks have questions. And I think we're going to type Thanks, them in. Michael. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're so I, I'll go over a couple of uh, news items uh, while people are typing if they want to go ahead and ask their questions. First, uh, thank you all for participating in this webinar. And uh, we have a survey that we would like to circulate. Let me just pop it here in the, the link here so that you guys can click on it. And we would really appreciate any feedback that the participants could provide, uh, including suggested uh, future topics or speakers. Uh, also, I just want to remind people that uh, to view presentations, join our discuss list where we circulate these registration, in, the registration information for these webinars, or to submit requests to present, you could visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Uh, the next webinar is September 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is risks of infrastructure and the road ahead, and this is by David Nally. Uh, and anything else? Nope. Uh, if you are not following us on Twitter, you can follow us at Trusted CI.
And I see some people are typing, so I'll just give you guys a little bit of time. Yeah, I'm going to uh, answer a question that I got at the um, at the workshop while while folks are typing. Um, one of the questions is, what if you have to have remote control of your instrument? For example, we have instruments in uh, you know other parts of the world where collaborators actually want to come on and control the instrument. That's kind of a tough problem, especially if the the control mechanism for the instrument is problematic. But you can still do separation because. It's possible that, for example, um, one of the one of the instruments. There's an instrument in China. It's a large tokamak reactor called East. General Atomics in San Diego uh, actually controls the East reactor remotely at times. So there's a separate channel that provides the ability to control the instrument, and only there, there are a whole lot of security controls that are applied to that channel. Only particular set of computers at General Atomics can talk to the particular set of computers at East, and they are pretty heavily firewalled off. At the same time, when the data is gathered from that instrument, from the East instrument, it's shared with a lot of collaborators, a lot of people who don't control the instrument. So again, using the same control channel to actually share the data is a really bad idea. So you have a separate control channel that controls the instrument, and that is heavily controlled and heavily firewalled off. And then you have uh, the data is then placed on a DTN. General Atomics has their own science DMZ uh, that connects to ESNet. And they use that to share the data with collaborators across the United States. So they are the main sort of data transfer node for fusion data for the US. So that's an example of how you can actually secure your control channel by making sure that you separate out the data transfer channel into a science DMZ. Okay, Great. so the, thank you. I'm taking yeah, we a look. We got a question here from Gregory. Yeah. So it says I struggle with professionally managing connection points like DTNs, communicating this need to research computing and how to put in place a process to allow feedback from our researchers to make sure their solution works for them by a feedback process. I guess I mean a change in request and evaluation process. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the question is there, but um, I think what what we're getting at, I think, Gregory, what, what you might be getting at here is the notion that the DTN has to be under the control of someone, maybe it's not necessarily central IT, maybe there's a, maybe you have a central research IT organization, or you have some group of people who are professionally managing this system or these sets of systems. And that um, the kinds of activities that people can do on a DTN are necessarily restricted. That allows the types of software and things that the DTN actually runs to be kept in check so that you can patch them easily and you can also minimize the kinds of risks that any vulnerabilities might expose you to. Uh, but at the same time, researchers often say, hey, it's a really big, fast computer that can translate, you know, transmit data really quickly. I want to put this on. I want to put that on. it. I want to run. We actually had a request um, on one of the mailing lists I'm on where somebody wanted to run a, an email server, uh, you know, basically a, a, like a mailman, like a list manager on in their science DMZ. Um, that really starts to break down this model, it, as, as I'm sure you know. And it, I'm sure it's hard to make that case that in order to uh, keep the security of the science DMZ something that can be mitigated by the set of controls we have there, we can't start adding functions to it willy-nilly. And um, the way you really have to, I mean, communicating that's always hard, but the way you have to, I think, the way you can communicate it is to really look at it as, as a set of trade-offs, to basically say, look, the way we manage to get the security folks to buy into this is to say we've deliberately limited the set of functions that we are allowing on this particular, um, particular network, this particular set of DTNs. And by doing that, um, that allows us to run without a big firewall or without 
other controls that otherwise would minimize the operational capabilities of the network. So instead, what we're going to do is use other sets of controls and other ways of limiting the risks we expose ourselves to. If we were to add things like other software that you want or you know, other functions that you want, um, if we were to throw up a web server for your lab on the DTN or in the science DMZ, then our security group would make us apply a whole lot of extra controls that would ultimately impact the function of the science DMZ. So the, the whole notion of the science DMZ would actually break down because we're actually going back to applying the same kind of controls that we're applying to the rest of the network or that we're applying to more quote unquote, you know, security conscious parts of the network. Again, not that the science DMZ isn't security conscious, but it's just the security issues are fundamentally different. So I think you really have to explain that to people in, in terms of, you know, if, if we do the things you want to do here, then we're going to have to apply a set of controls that's going to actually undermine the functionality of the one thing the Science DMZ does really well. So the next question is, do you see a place uh, for data diodes in front of lab instruments? And I assume that in this case, that was sort of like the data diodes or like the data door I was talking about. Um, I think the, the problem with that, just sticking them in front of lab instruments is a scalability problem there. And so you have a lot of them, if you have a lot of instruments on your campus and a lot of different instruments, uh, can you scale the, can you scale that function and can you scale the management of the function and can you scale the security, what security controls you do, do need to apply to the function? You know, that, that sort of, again, starts to break down your segmentation because you have, you have data uh, transfer systems that are going to be placed at different parts of your um, different parts of your network. So separating out the data transfer function so that you can apply different or better security controls to it and different or better security controls to the instruments themselves becomes a lot harder. So that's why I think scaling it and concentrating it into a science DMZ is actually going to help you both on a security and on an operational performance perspective. Okay, so and then the next question is uh, any good documents? Oh, my computer just went to sleep. Any good documents for building and securing a, a, a science DMZ? One of the things I'd recommend to you is that there's a canonical paper on the science DMZ it's also linked off of the Faster Data site. And I don't know why I didn't include that as a set of resources at the end of my slides, but fasterdata.es.net, Faster Data is all one word, fasterdata.es.net is kind of a clearinghouse for uh, science DMZ topics and also for things like host tuning. If you want to know how do, how do I tune a, a Linux host, how do I tune a Solaris host that's running my ZFS file system, you know, how do I do these different things? And so it, it provides you with some of these resources as, as well. I notice also Jim Warner is on the call here, and it, it, it does have a link to Jim's absolutely fantastic web page that lists uh, network equipment, switches, and routers, and shows the amount of queue depth and uh, buffering space that those devices have available. That is like the Bible of science DMZs, because remember the science DMZ is not just about applying security controls. It's also about making sure that the things that need to be in line have the best performance capabilities for large scale data flows. So in this particular case, we want buffer bloat and Jim's page is great. So that's also linked off the faster data uh, web page and a bunch of other things so that it gives you uh, different types of equipment you can buy and, and other sorts of things. I would also look into in terms of um, the kinds of security controls that you can apply to a science DMZ that work very well in the context of a science DMZ. I would look at um, presentations by Nick Baraglio, also of ESNet. Um, it's B-U-R-A-G-L-I-O. And Nick presents a lot on the, the actual science, the, the sort of control side of the science DMZ security. So if you search for him and you search for science DMZ security, you're going to find a few presentations that have lots of interesting ideas for ways in which you can 
provide extra controls for your science DMZ. One of the things that I got asked at the workshop last week, and, and it also gets, gets into the whole notion of security controls, one of the advantages that segmentation gives you is it gives you the ability to actually separate your science DMZ from the rest of your campus network. So if your security officer is really kind of having difficulty with this whole idea of this science DMZ being uh, stuck in the, um, you know, right in the middle of the campus network, by separating the science DMZ, it actually allows the rest of the campus network to treat the science DMZ as an untrusted network. So you can actually firewall off the science DMZ as though it's part of your outside network. I mean, that's kind of the purpose of it being a DMZ. Um, so again, I would look for Nick to, uh, to provide you with some of the information and also go to fasterdata.es.net. Okay, how quickly can we have a question from, yeah. oh. from Ben? That's the one. How quickly do these network segments and or ESNet respond to false attacks today with current systems methods? Have there been many attacks and faults? Is that the next one? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, so that one is, is interesting. And one of the things I didn't include in my diagram of the science DMZ, but you're going to see in other diagrams is uh, Personar. So, so there's really two issues. One is faults, and the other one is attacks. So the way you, the way you, the sort of canonical way that you want to try to um, detect attacks is using a very strong um, set of event correlation systems, as well as using something like Bro, which is you know can't even really call it an intrusion detection system. It's basically a packet processing language but it allows you to monitor the network for all sorts of potential events that may indicate upcoming attacks or may indicate that something's actually been compromised. The other thing you want to put in your network is Personar. And Personar is going to provide a, and, and if you look at the faster data site, it also has links to Personar and also talks about how you add Personar nodes and put in Personar meshes. Um, so you're going to see, um, uh, you're going to be able to, to use the Personar node to determine what the level of network performance is with other, other science DMZs in other locations. And if you, I see a bunch of people from the Pacific Research Platform community here, I see Celeste and a few other people on the, uh, on the call, and if you look at what they're doing at the Pacific Research Platform, uh, they are actually, uh, they've actually built an entire Persona mesh. And the Pacific Research Platform is really kind of a collaboration and interconnection of a bunch of science DMZs, mostly in California with a few other campuses uh, thrown in there. And uh, they have an entire Persona mesh that is, um, you know, just between those science DMZs. And using Personar, you can actually detect very early on if packet loss is happening. That packet loss could be due to just simply a network fault, or it could also be due to a, um, actually could be due to a, a, an attack of some sort. So by monitoring the performance of the network very carefully, you can also respond very quickly to attacks. In terms of how quickly we can respond to, to different types of things, it, it depends on what's sort of causing the problem also. Sometimes we have hardware problems that take a while to fix just because we need to get new hardware shipped out. If it's a security problem, we actually haven't, I, I haven't been aware of um, in the national lab complex instances of attacks on the, on the DTNs themselves where they've been compromised or there's been an attack that had to be mitigated. A lot of times what happens in the complex is user accounts on supercomputers get compromised and those need to be fixed. Those get reacted to very quickly through other means. They use things like instrumented SSH and stuff like that in order to make sure that they are, um, that there's not um, untoward activity going on on the supercomputer. So there's a, the question is complicated. I should say the question is simple. The answer is complicated because there's a lot of different things that could be happening. There are 
actual network faults, there are DOS attacks, there are compromises, there are user account compromises. And so the way of responding to those and the kinds of things you use to detect them are all different. For network-based attacks, you'd be using Bro to try to do uh, detection and mitigation. Bro can do mitigation by injecting black hole routes into your border router so you can prevent attacks from happening that way very quickly. And we can do this um, in ESNet and LBL and other places. You know, it's on the order of seconds that we can, we can block hosts that are causing problems. So uh, you can, you know, the response time is anywhere from seconds to if you've got a dirty, dirty fiber and someone needs to go out to clean it, which is more of a fault, that can take longer. And if you have to replace hardware, that can take longer as well. And then John Graham has pointed out the Pacific Research Platform. John is, is with uh, UCSD, and he's an a, a important component of the Pacific Research Platform. He's pointed out that the PRP also has a grid FTP MAD dash. Um, MAD dash is a way of actually showing, displaying transfer capabilities and throughput capabilities, either with perf sonar or with other mechanisms. It provides you with a, a dashboard that gives you a very easy visualization of how your network is doing in terms of what the throughput looks like, whether it's just perf sonar throughput or whether it's actual data throughput. So thanks for reminding me of that, John. Um, did I miss any questions? Has anyone else typed in? I need to scroll nope. back. Nope, it looks like we covered them all. Uh, I guess we'll just leave one last call for questions. I managed and to get through the Typing. I managed to get through the entire thing without coughing, although I really need a glass oh, yeah. of water. <laughs> well, Michael, I just want to thank you again so much for agreeing to present. Um, and uh, for those of you who uh, want to share this presentation with people who may have missed it, I will be posting links to the recording uh, later in the next day or so. So uh, having done that, I just want to thank you again. And uh, I will stop recording in a moment here. Thank you guys very much for having me. It was really a pleasure. It's always nice to, to talk to folks from different communities. So, um, and, and of course, I know a lot of people on this. So I hope I didn't embarrass myself too badly. Oh, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.